This is a short video lecture continuing on waste management. In the previous lecture, it was mentioned that one of the options in dealing with our waste is to bury it in landfills. And I went over some details about the construction and the operation of sanitary landfills. Another option for our waste is to take the waste to a waste to energy facility and burn it and use the heat from burning the waste to convert water into steam, spin a turbine, and generate electricity. Here in the United States we have 172 waste to energy facilities. We burn about 37 million tons of waste each year and the benefit to utilizing a waste to energy facility is that it decreases the volume of trash by 90 percent. The remaining byproduct of burning the waste is an ash material. So for every 10 trucks that come into the facility with full of garbage, only one truck leaves with ash to go to the landfill for final disposal. The graphic on the right depicts the various countries and the amount that they rely upon waste energy recovery. So it's the total municipal solid waste that's burned with energy recovery in their country. Japan is leading with about 70% of their waste being burned and converted to energy recovery. And the U.S. is last with the least amount of waste being burned and converted to electricity. We're at about 13%. This is a schematic of a waste to energy facility. Sometimes they're called incinerators. They have pollution controls that help limit any emissions going into the air. So what happens is mixed solid wastes are deposited into the waste pit from trucks that enter the tipping floor. A giant claw or crane will mix the trash in this pit, grab it, and then dump it into the feed chamber that feeds into the furnace. The waste is burned, releasing heat. Typically the waste is burned at about 1800 degrees. The heat from the burn takes water and converts it to steam, which then spins a turbine that provides electricity onto the electric grid. An air pollution control system, which is designated here in the diagram, removes pollutants from the combustion gas before it's released through a smokestack. The air pollution con control system can include a wet scrubber, as well as a bag house and some chemical additives that help precipitate things out into the bottom ash or fly ash. Two byproducts of burning waste are bottom ash that comes directly from burning the waste in the furnace and fly ash that comes from removing fine particulate matter from the uh, air that comes off of the waste when it's burning. Both of these types of ash can be put into a truck and taken to the local landfill for disposal. As mentioned in the previous slide, the United States burns about 13% of its municipal waste. Canada actually burns less. They're at about 8%. And then when we look at Great Britain, they are currently burning about 90% of its municipal solid waste in incinerators. So various countries rely upon these types of waste management and waste reduction facilities in different amounts. So the waste material can be considered fuel. One ton of municipal solid waste burned in a waste to energy facility can generate about 480 kilowatt hours of electricity. This is the amount of electricity that is used by 16 US households in one day. So this is just for one ton of municipal solid waste. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, 2,000 pounds or one ton of garbage can be reduced to 300 pounds of ash, almost a 90% reduction in volume, which is a benefit in terms of landfill space. Now this waste is no longer going to the landfill, taking up more space, but rather it's being burned, converted to electricity, and then the ash, about a 90% reduction in waste volume, is then sent to the landfill. So based on the previous two slides, the U.S. does not rely heavily on the waste to energy practices for reducing trash volume. 
In fact, since 1985, more than 280 new waste to energy projects have been delayed or canceled in the United States because of the high costs, the concern for air pollution, and intense citizen opposition. This is a picture of a waste to energy facility. This is the tipping floor or the garbage pit where trucks back right up to the edge and dump the garbage directly into the pit or they dump it onto the concrete tipping floor where it's inspected before it's pushed into the pit with a bulldozer. This is a picture of a grappling crane. This grapple will grab waste and then mix it and move it around in the pit to try to make it as uniform as it can so that the waste or fuel burns consistently in the fuel chamber. Also, this grapple crane is operated by a crane operator that's pictured here, and they lift the crane up to the feed chute and then dump the waste into the feed chute where it then goes into the burn chamber as depicted here. While burning the waste, ash is created and the ash falls out through some grates into an ash conveyor system. And this is a picture of an ash conveyor system. So some advantages and disadvantages of uh, waste to energy or incineration. One definite advantage is that it definitely reduces the trash volume by 90%, which makes less need for landfills or the expansion of existing landfills. There's also considered to be lower water pollution associated with these facilities. And it can concentrate any kind of hazardous substance in the ash for burial. You also get energy sold into the grid, which reduces the cost of operations for the facility. And we have current technology for air treatment and air quality control systems to minimize any emissions going out the smokestack. The disadvantages are that they're very expensive to build. They cost more than hauling to landfills based on the tipping fees. They can be difficult to cite because of public opposition. And one of the main concerns in the emissions is carbon dioxide, which contributes to greenhouse gases or climate change gases. There are older facilities in the United States, and if they're poorly managed, they can release large amounts of air pollution. However, this industry is heavily regulated, and as a result, they're continually upgrading and updating their plants in order to make sure they adhere to the requirements of the Clean Air Act. The approach with the waste to energy facility doesn't fix our waste management problem. It's a temporary solution where it helps reduce the volume of waste going to a landfill. Some people consider this as an approach that encourages waste production. And then you do have the issue that a waste to energy facility can actually compete with recycling for burnable materials such as newspaper. Okay, so switching gears, another part of waste management is dealing with the storage of fuel or other materials in tanks, either above ground storage tanks or underground storage tanks. In 1988, the RECRA law that was originally passed in 1976 was amended to include requirements in subtitle I for underground storage tanks. An underground storage tank is a tank system that includes the piping where at least 10% of its volume is underground. So at the federal level, we passed a law with requirements for underground storage tanks and the states then um, implement those requirements. The reason for these amendments was because it was discovered that steel tanks leak at a much greater frequency after about being 12 years old and in service for 12 years. Most underground storage tanks, as pictured here in this picture, were installed back in the 1940s through the 1960s. So by the time this amendment was passed in 1988, uh, 48 to 28 years had already passed and the likelihood that the steel underground st storage tank was leaking was very high. So in other words, tanks were almost 50 years old when we passed this amendment that dealt with dealing with underground storage tanks. New USTs are required to be coated for protection from corrosion. These new tanks began to appear in the 1970s, and they were made out of fiberglass reinforced plastic, or FRP, steel with corrosive resistant coating and cathodic protection, or a composite between the steel and the FRP. 
So as of 1985, only these three types of tank materials are allowed to be installed. So any new tanks that have been installed since 1985 that leak, it's likely the leak is attributed to equipment failure such as um, installation practices, installing the tank improperly, or piping failures, or overfills. So going back to these amendments, the RECRA amendments of 1988 dealt with closing um, underground storage tanks and making sure that they weren't leaking. If they were leaking, they had to remove the tank by 1998 and then put into place a replacement tank that met the um, composition requirements of FRP or steel with uh, corrosive protection. In 1988, when this law was passed, the EPA estimated that we had over 2 million underground storage tanks at over 700,000 different facilities, including gas stations on the corner in your home community. And again, since most of these tanks were over 20 years old, uh, some of which were 40 years old, the likelihood of corrosion and leakage was high. And this is a picture of a tank that's being removed that has a bunch of tiny rust holes in the bottom of the tank and the actual material spilling out of it. And this is a picture of all the pipes that are moving the gasoline from the tank to the fueling station at a gas station. And here's a picture of a tank that's uh, designated for removal. In terms of underground storage tanks, we do have some tanks that fall into the category of non-regulated tanks. Any residential or farm tanks that are less than 1,100 gallons that store motor fuel, heating oil, or even a septic tank do not fall under the 1988 RECRA amendments. Also, if you have a storage tank on or above the basement floor in your basement for fuel oil, it's not covered by this amendment. So other than these non-regulated tanks, any other tank is considered regulate, regulated and it falls under the 1988 amendments to RECRA. The states are the ones that actually enforce these UST regulations and they require that every tank have a registration code assigned to it and documentation is on file with the state and the federal government regarding what size the tank is, when it was installed, and what the materials are that are being held in that tank. So you also have to have a permit for the operation, installation, and including the closure of the tank. The other part of the law requires that any tank owner must report any spills or leaks within 24 hours of detection. So these tanks also have leak detection systems in place as well as um, content level monitoring devices to measure whether or not the content is potentially leaking. And then finally, the owners of these tanks are the ones that are financially responsible for doing any cleanup associated with the leaking tanks.